There's a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. God does not raise up prophets when things are good. He raises up prophets either when things are bad or are in serious danger of becoming bad. Good morning, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you all this morning here in Columbus, just doing a sound check. Am I all right? Yes? No? Better? All right. One or two Martha things before the Mary things. Our particular thanks to the local fellowship here and its leadership for organizing a conference for David Hawking and myself. If you are somebody who lives within a reasonable circumference of where we are situated here in the Columbus area, this particular fellowship where we are is affiliated, we're happy to say, with our ministry, Moriel. We recommend this fellowship and its doctrine and its teaching is biblically solid. If you need a fellowship, you'd be more than Welcome to worship here at this one. Again, it has our sanction. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for all things, for your wondrous salvation, for your undeserved goodness to us all, Lord God, for your patience and that you give us a patient endurance that's beyond our capacity. We thank you, Lord God, that we have a sure and living hope. We thank you, Lord God, that you want to meet with us now and speak to us through your word by your spirit. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive that which you would say. But let people not hear from a man, only by your grace through a man, that your name would be glorified and your people edified. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, the one who saved us. Amen. Turn with me, please, to the Hebrew prophet Amos. The Hebrew prophet Amos, chapter 7, first of all. We call him in Hebrew, Amos Hanavi. Amos is prophesying circa 750 B.C. Circa 750 B.C. Now in 720, 721 B.C., the Assyrian captivity was about to take place. The Assyrian captivity is to the ten northern tribes what the Babylonian captivity would be to the two southern tribes, only worse. The moral abomination, social injustice, and above all idolatry had become unspeakable during the time of Jeroboam II. Things had become so desperate that with one exception, Hosea, with one exception, God could not even find a prophetic voice in Israel in the ten northern tribes. He had to send Amos up from the south. He had to get somebody to go up there from Judah because he couldn't find anybody who was willing to uphold the truth anymore. He couldn't even find one voice, so he sends up Amos. Amos, like so many of the faithful servants God has called, was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Whenever you see somebody called to a leadership role who'd been a shepherd, they prefigured Jesus as the good shepherd. Can you take care of the sheep? Well, can you take care of the Lord's sheep, which includes protecting them from the wolves and feeding them during difficult times when food is scarce? Such was Amos. So Amos, like all of Israel's prophets, he prophesies for three different time frames. Like all of the prophets, the Hebrew prophets, he prophesies for three different time frames. He prophesies for his own time. The events leading up to the Assyrian captivity, 720, 721 BC, thereabout. He's about 750, but the captivity was 30 years later. It was coming. Secondly, he prophesies for the first coming of Jesus. He prophesies for the first coming of the Messiah. And finally, he prophesies eschatologically for the return of the Messiah. All of Israel's prophets, all the Hebrew prophets, prophesy for three time frames, basically. For their own time, for the first coming of Christ, and for the second coming. We always have to determine what is for their own time, what's for the first coming, what's for the second coming, or even what's for a combination. Sometimes something that happened, as prophesied, has a double fulfillment or has a second meaning, what we sometimes call as a Pesher interpretation. This is simply background, however. Let's look at Amos chapter 7. It is a time of idolatry. It is a time of corruption in the judiciary. The Levitical court system was corrupt. They had a corrupt judiciary and a corrupt government. 
Not only that, it was a time of renegade social injustice. Renegade social injustice. God would not allow certain things among his people if they kept the Torah. There, for instance, could be no slavery, only indenturism. At the year of Jubilee, a slave had a right to go free, but he wouldn't be a slave, he'd only be indentured, contractually obligated to work for somebody until the year of Jubilee. That was being violated. People were losing their land. In the year of Jubilee, land was to be repatriated, but that was not happening. God did not allow foreclosures. He only allowed someone to lose their land temporarily so the creditors could regain the equity or the principal. Then the people would get the land back. All of these principles and divine justice were being violated. Now, when we understand the economic justice that was being violated in the book of Amos, we get a hint of the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ. When the government is upon his shoulders, thank God, no more cursed politicians. Jesus will be running the show, but when we see the principles of social and economic justice that you see that were decreed in the Torah, this gives us a hint of the way the economy and government is divinely designed to operate and how it will operate when Jesus is calling the shots instead of politicians and crooked courts as we have today. Well, this is what he's up against. Corrupt judiciary, corrupt politicians. But as we see repeatedly in Kings and Chronicles, nations would get the leaders they deserve. Nations would get the leaders they deserve. People can bemoan Bush, they can bemoan Obama, they can bemoan any of these politicians, Clinton, whatever. Oh, they're crooked, they're hypocrites, they're liars. Well, of course they are. Godless nations get godless leaders. That doesn't say we shouldn't pray for them, but it does say nations get the leaders they deserve. We have what we deserve as a nation. Well, Israel is a microcosm of all nations. God uses Israel to teach what the human condition is like. It's a microcosm of the human condition. And so we see this. Now remember, he's speaking for his own time. He's speaking for the first coming and for the second coming. On top of all of this was godlessness and idolatry. Godlessness and idolatry had abounded under Jeroboam. And just look at the world today. Godless, idolatrous people going into Eastern religions and God knows what else. Chapter 7 of Amos will begin at verse 7. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And he said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel laid waste. Then shall I rise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. God was going to raise up against their national political leaders. But their national political leaders were closely associated with false religion and idolatrous worship. False religion and idolatrous worship was being accommodated. We are told, for instance, in 1 John, that that which denies the father and son relationship is antichrist. Among other religions, Islam is an antichrist religion. It says in the Quran, uh, in the Surah, in the Quran, God has no son. He is not begotten, either does he beget. He fundamentally rejects the sonship, the divine sonship of Jesus is fundamentally rejected in the Quran. Yet I'm only stating a fact. George Bush, after September 11, put a copy of the Koran in the White House to honor Islam. An antichrist book, by New Testament definition, and he puts it in the White House to honor Islam. We get the leaders we deserve. Leaders who bring us into the way of idolatry, into the worship of other gods. That is simply what is happening. It's what was happening then, it's what is happening now. You will frequently find a relationship between idolatry and injustice. The most unjust societies in the world, whereas the most social injustice are the ones who have false religions and idolatry. You look at India and the caste system. Why? Hinduism. You look at Southeast Asia. Why? Buddhism. You look at Haiti. Why? Voodoo. Idolatry and false religion breed injustice. 
the concept that we are imagio dei beings made in God's image and likeness does not filter through into their worldview the way it does in a Judeo-Christian worldview. But once the Judeo-Christian worldview is abandoned, we become the same as the heathen nations. This is what was happening in Amos' day. This is what is happening in our day. Now look at what it says. It says the high places of Isaac. We know from the New Testament that Isaac, Itzhak, was a type of Christ. The son is placed on the altar, but he gets him back in figure. The people began worshiping falsely. They began worshiping falsely. Verse 10. Then Amaziah, not to be confused with the king, this is a priest. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, the house of God, sent word to Jeroboam. This is Jeroboam the second, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure his words. For thus Amos says, Jeroboam will die by the sword. Israel will certainly go into the land into exile. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee away to the land of Judah. There eat and there do your prophesying. No longer prophesy at Bethel, for it is the sanctuary of the king and a royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I'm not a prophet, nor am I the son of a prophet, for I'm a herdsman, that is a shepherd, and a grower of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. And now hear the word of the Lord, you who are saying you shall not prophesy against Israel, nor shall you speak against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, your wife will become a harlot in the city. Your sons and your daughters will fall by the sword, your land will be parceled up by measuring line, and you yourself will die upon unclean soil. Moreover, Israel will certainly go from its land into exile. Go back where you came from. Go back down south to Judah. Get out of here. We don't want you to come up here. Who sent you up here? You're not a local. Again, except for Hosea, God couldn't find a local. He had to send somebody up from the south. He couldn't find anybody willing to take a stand. Go back where you came from, you seer, mocking him, calling him like a visionary or somebody having deliriums or delusional visions instead of a prophet of God. And he says, I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. I was just a shepherd. I'm here for one reason and one reason only. God sent me. His ministry in the north did not last very long. It was short-lived. Some people say only a few days. We don't know, but it was not for long. He didn't want the job. Be careful of people running around claiming to be prophets. If anybody goes around claiming to be a prophet, the overwhelming likelihood is that they are a false one. If somebody goes around who wants to be a prophet, the overwhelming likelihood is they want to make a prophet. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind wants that job. God does not raise up prophets when things are good. He raises up prophets either when things are bad or are in serious danger of becoming bad. Otherwise, you wouldn't need a prophet to point people back to the scriptures. Nobody in their right mind wants that job. If somebody really is a prophet, they don't have to say I'm a prophet. In fact, they don't want to be a prophet. The Holy Spirit is going to show the faithful people of God, that's a prophet. That's a prophet. They don't have to say it. The Holy Spirit's going to tell the people that that's a prophet. Remember John the Baptist? The people held him to be a prophet. He didn't go around saying he was a prophet. A true prophet doesn't have to say he is one. Most of what you see today, these people running around, I had a picture, the Lord gave me a vision, I had a dream. That is not prophecy. It is clairvoyance. It is clairvoyance. Rick Joyner is not a biblical prophet. He's a clairvoyant. Cindy Jacobs is a clairvoyant. Gerald Coates in England is a clairvoyant. Mike Bickle is a clairvoyant. These are the false prophets Jesus warned would come in the last days to deceive the elect. 
That's why they're always predicting things that don't happen. Can you imagine a tattooed goon kicking old ladies in the face? Can't get a visa to go into Australia. Can't get a visa to go to Great Britain. They won't let him in. He kicked too many old ladies in the face. Covered with tattoos. And four major evangelical leaders on TV. This is not gossip. On TV. Peter Wagner, Bill Johnson, Cheyenne, and Rick Joyner prophesy over the tattooed goon how he's going to lead the great revival. Four days later, four days later, he abandons his handicapped wife and three children. He leaves his wife, a handicapped wife with three little kids, and takes off with a babe with whom he's been having an affair. Of course, that was something of an improvement. Earlier, he'd been in prison for homosexually molesting a seven-year-old. Divorces his biblical wife after abandoning his kids, marries this floozy he runs off with, and now she's prophesying with him, and Rick Joyner's rehabilitating them. Open whoredom, open adultery. Yet these are the prophets. This is how sick and perverted it has become. Hence the use of the term, your wife shall be a harlot. He's using an imagery we find in the New Testament, used by the Apostle James and also by Hosea, where idolatry was equated with adultery. Israel was to be God's woman as the church is the bride of Christ. Hence, idolatry is called adultery. Daughter of Zion, you played the harlot. The sexual immorality is a reflection of the spiritual infidelity. You understand? One is a picture of the other. When James writes this, writing to Jewish believers in the first century church, the oldest book of the New Testament, James calls worldly churches adulteresses. This would have shocked them. You're saying we're guilty of the same kind of whoredom as our forefathers in the Old Testament? Yes. And he's writing it to the church. That's quite a thing. Well, that's what was happening. So he goes on, get out of here, go back where you came from, beat it, scram, we don't want to hear it. How dare you come to Bethel? It's the palace of the king. If their hearts were right with God, they would have been zealous for Jerusalem, where the holy ark was, where the divine presence was. They would have been zealous for Jerusalem. But they were more zealous, their holy place, their sanctum sanctorum, was where their head honcho was. You will always see this. We've explained this on the David and Goliath tape. Every false religion, every cult, every backslidden denomination have something in common. They worship the ism. They deify the ism. If you understand Jehovah's Witnesses, it's not about Jehovah. They worship the Watchtower Society. If you understand Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, they worship Mormonism. If you understand Islam, it's not about Allah. They worship Islam. If you've been saved out of real Roman Catholicism, you don't see real Roman Catholicism in the United States, but you would see it in like Mexico or Ireland or somewhere like that. When you understand real Roman Catholicism, it's not about Jesus or Mary. It's Holy Mother the Church. Roman Catholics worship Catholicism. They worship the ism. Every false religion, every cult worships the ism. They deify the false religious system itself. That's their true God. It's about the ism. How dare you come to Bethel? This is the house of God. Well, the house of God was in Jerusalem. Continues. Go back where you came from. Don't come up here and prophesy. You're predicting judgment. Then it continues. Chapter 8, verse 1, there's no chapter divisions in the Hebrew text. Thus the Lord showed me, and behold, there was a basket of summer fruit. And he said, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. A brief lesson in Biblical Hebrew, if you please. Wordplay in English is generally used as 
a literary device to communicate a joke or as an advertising gimmick. I remember when I was a little boy in New York, I saw an advert in a newspaper for a company called Quality Coal, K-O-A-L. They intentionally misspelled coal in order to draw people's attention to the advert. When we use wordplay in English, it's either to make a joke or as an advertising gimmick. In Biblical Hebrew, it's the opposite. When you see wordplay, it's to draw people's attention to something very serious. One example, look at Matthew's nativity narrative in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 2. Verse 23, when Jesus comes out of Egypt as a baby, it says, that was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. There is no such verse anywhere in the Old Testament, he shall be called a Nazarene. It's not in there. But there is a verse in Isaiah, a well-known one, which the Jews of that day understood to be prophetic about the Messiah. The Messiah shall be a, not Nazarene, but Netzer, a righteous branch. Not Nezer, but Netzer. You get one word that sounds like another to draw people's attention to the text. The Messiah shall be the righteous branch. Well, Amos is doing the same thing, a basket of summer fruit. In the heat of the Middle East, if the fruit is not harvested by summer, it's going to be burned up by the sun. Why do you say this? Summer fruit because the end has come for my people Israel. The Hebrew word for summer is kayetz, kayetz. The Hebrew word for the end, termination, finality, is ketz, kayetz, ketz. What do you see? A basket of priya kayetz, of summer fruit. Why do you see something to do with the kayetz? Because the ketz has come. It's using Hebrew wordplay. Only in Hebrew, in Biblical Hebrew, it means something serious, not something light. The end is coming. I'll spare them no longer. The songs of the palace will turn to wailing in that day, declares the Lord. Many will be the corpses in every place. They will cast them forth in silence. Notice the palace first. The judgment begins on the crooked politicians. Then the silly people who support Hear this, you who trample the needy. To do away with the humble of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may open the wheat market. To make the bushel smaller and the shekel bigger. To cheat with dishonest scales so as to buy the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals, that we may sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, notice religious pride, indeed I will never forget any of their deeds. Because of this will not the land quake, and everyone who dwells in it mourn. Indeed all of it will rise up like the Nile, and will be tossed about and subside like the Nile of Egypt. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let's look. Again, it says three times in Proverbs, differing weights and measures are an abomination to the Lord. An unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. It's not just talking about financial chicanery in the marketplace. The grain, the grain, the bread of life, the gospel, the word of God. The shekel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller. Turn on the money preachers on the idiot box. Look what the world is looking at. The shekel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller. The more they preach about money, the less they expound the word of God. The New Testament says very little about money. And most of what it says is a warning. 
The love of money, not money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Most of what it says is a warning, but it doesn't overall say much. The average money preacher has been calculated on TV. The average televangelist speaks about money more than 70% of the airtime. In the scripture, it is less than 1%. They speak about it 70%. It comes into every sermon. Diverting God knows how many, not millions, way more than millions, away from honest ministries into the coffers of these people who prostitute the word of God for their own aggrandizement. The Sister Joyce Earring and Facelift Fund, etc. And the world sees right through it, discredits the gospel, the shekel gets bigger, the bushel gets smaller. The more they talk about money, the less they talk about Jesus. They sell the refuse of the wheat. They sell the garbage. They sell the garbage. One of the most important chapters in understanding the last days is indisputably Yeremiah Hanavi, Jeremiah chapter 23. Look at it, please. Verse 1, and it begins, Woe to the shepherds. In Hebrew, Oi Leroim. The problem is not false prophets or even false teachers. The problem is the shepherds. The Hebrew word for shepherd and pastor is the same word, roe. The Greek words for pastor and shepherd, episkopo and poeon, are the same word for pastor and shepherd. The problem is not the false teachers or false prophets. The problem is the pastors who will not protect the sheep from them. Before Jeremiah is motivated, animated by the Holy Spirit to address the false teachers and false prophets, he addresses the pastors who do not protect the people from them. Let's look at chapter 23 further. Verse 25, I heard what the prophets have said. I had a dream, I had a dream. Oy vavoy. Verse 28, the prophet who has a dream may relate his dream, but let him who has my word speak my word in truth. What does straw have in common with grain? What does straw have in common with grain? If you've been to Israel even to this day, you'll see at a distance the color, the texture, the appearance, and the size, the height of the weeds, tares, and the kinds of wheat that grow best indigenously in Galilee, the wheat belt of Israel, look the same. It's only when you get up close you see that one has grits and one doesn't. One is real grain and one isn't. They feed people straw and charge a high price for it. Can you imagine? It's late at night, nothing open, you have to eat junk food. So you drive through McDonald's and they charge you for a filet mignon. They give you a junk burger and they charge you for Chateaubriand. They think it's Le Tour d'Argent, but it's McDonald's. <laughs> Shekel gets bigger. The bushel gets smaller. Always like that. And the people don't know any better. They're being misled. I recall I was in Japan one time, in Japan lots of times. There's only two things I can understand in Japan. One is yaku, baseball, same as our baseball. We can watch the baseball game. The other thing is the news in English for the American forces. And so I'm watching the news, and I had a news report showing from North Korea what the communists were calling, it was Kim Il-sung then, miracle food. And they had these guys in these white lab coats and a machine about 12 or 15 feet long. And they were stuffing pumpkin leaves and other such things into one end of the machine that was crushing it and liquefying it, and processing it with chemical additives. On the other end of the machine, long strips of ribbon coming out that look like green fettuccine some kind of noodles. They called it miracle food. When I was in university, I was taught that the digestive enzyme for catabolizing cellulose is synthesized in appendixes. Squirrels and rabbits have a huge appendix. Ours is very small. We can't digest 
cellulose. Only rabbits and squirrels can. At least that's what they taught me when I was a kid in university. Well, anyway, what they were doing in North Korea, what the communists were doing, they were giving people cellulose. But they were chemically treating it to artificially raise the monosodium, monosodium glucose levels in the blood to trick their brain into thinking they were satiated. They were systematically being malnourished to the point of virtual starvation. But they thought they were eating something. But they weren't. Miracle food. Miracle food. That's what the church is serving. That's what the tele-evangelists are serving. That's what the emergent church is serving. That is what the purpose-driven lie is serving. Phony food. Make-believe doctrine. Worthless garbage. People are dying from spiritual malnutrition. Metabolically, what are one of the first consequences of protracted malnutrition? A breakdown of the immune system. Then they catch anything. <laughs> Christians are going off into all sorts. They have no immune system. They can't recognize true food anymore. Their brain is being tricked by shysters, by connivers, many of whom are just out for the buck. That's what Amos was up against, but the story continues. It was all about money. When will the market be open that we may sell the refuse of the weeds? But the judgment is coming. Now he shifts time frames in verse 9. It's going to be like the Egypt. The Nile raises, floods everything, then it recedes. Something has to happen. Everything's got to be flooded out. A flood is always a picture of judgment, as in Noah. And then some kind of a restoration. It'll come about on that day, in verse 9, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and make the earth dark and broad daylight. The sun will go down at noon and make the earth dark and broad daylight. Turn with me very briefly, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 23. It was now about the sixth hour. They reckon time from sunrise, so we're talking 12 noon. Sun rising at six at Passover time in the spring. It was now about approximately the sixth hour. Passover is the 14th of Nisan. This could not have been a solar or a lunar eclipse. It could not have been an eclipse. God had to do something in, supernaturally. Was he crucified on a Friday or a Thursday? Where do you get the three days and three nights? Theology is like science or like criminal investigation. The most obvious answer is usually the right one. Jews, to this day, tabulate time, night to dark. They fast from sundown to sundown. My family are Jewish, Israeli. They fast from sundown to sundown. Shabbat, Sabbath is from sundown to sundown. That's how it works. Okay. Jesus crucified on a Friday, but the sun goes down at noon. One day. It doesn't matter if there's one hour of daylight left or 20 hours of daylight left. It only matters or the hoshek, light to dark, how many times the sun goes down. One day, Friday before noon. Two days, Friday afternoon, and the sun goes back up. No problem. Saturday, sun is up. Sunday, uh, Saturday night, sun goes down. Sunday, sun's back up. You have three days and three nights as a Jew counts time. There's no problem with it. We have two words for time in the New Testament. Kronos and Kairos. Kairos is a clock, linear time. Eternity is not a clock that keeps going. Eternity is the absence of any clock at all. The other term is Kronos. We get the word chronology, an order of events. As we see in the book of Revelation, you do not have Kairos. Kairos works by planetary motion. In fact, we do have atomic clocks that work by particle emission, but even they have to be calibrated in terms of nanoseconds. No planetary motion, there's no linear time. Okay. 
When Jesus returns, it's described as the Uranus in Greek, the Shemaim in Hebrew being rolled up like a scroll. Paul speaks of the third heaven, doesn't he, in 2 Corinthians? The first heaven, the atmosphere of the earth. The second, outer space. The third is eternity. It's the second one that determines time. It's rolled up like a scroll. Eternity meets time and space. You understand? Because the sky is rolled up. Time depends on the second heaven. Certain times in Scripture, God intervenes with time. In the book of Joshua, a day was 48 hours. In Revelation, a day will go from 24 hours to 16. A third of the day, a third of the night will disappear. Okay? Uh, technically speaking, in the North Pole, a day is six months. <laughs> it's always or Lehoshek. God intervenes with time. He does it in Joshua, does it in Revelation. He does it when Jesus dies. You see that? He intervenes with time to make it three days and three nights. Well, King Hezekiah, a king of the Jews, God intervened with time. He made the sun go back, remember? The average lifespan at that time was between 50 and 55. King Hezekiah was in his 30s. One king of the Jews had his life extended. To balance it out, another king of the Jews had to have his life shortened. God has to intervene with time. You understand? It all has to balance. Make any sense? That's Kairos. Kronos is different. How can you have an order of events without time? The scripture speaks of the death of a believer as going to sleep for two reasons. One, if you go to sleep, you wake up again as per the resurrection. That's obvious. But the other is, as neurophysiology tells us, when you go to sleep, you dream. When you dream, you can see dead people alive again. You can see past events taking place again. You can see future events taking place. Past, present, and future take place. There's a chronology, there's an order, but there's no time. It's like going to sleep. Sleep teaches about the nature of eternity. Are you afraid to go to sleep? No. Well, if you're a believer, don't be afraid to die. If you're not a believer, boy, are you in trouble. Nonetheless, that's what it's like. Remember, death is not a mystery. There are many things called mysterion in Scripture. There are many mysteries in Scripture, good and bad. The mystery of godlessness, the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of the gospel. But death is never called a mystery. People mystified it. You understand? God did not make it a mystery. You go to sleep. Your consciousness enters a different sphere. We are in the conscious presence of the Lord, but it's in a different sphere of reality, akin to what happens when we are asleep. Things that could make no possible sense when we're awake make perfectly coherent sense in the dream. Dead people are alive again, etc., etc. That's what it's like. God intervenes here with time. When Jesus dies, so now the prophecy is fulfilled. Amos has shifted from his own time to speaking about the time of the first coming of Jesus, which he does with this prophecy in Amos chapter 8 um, and verse, uh, verse 9. In verse 10, you see the language of the lamentation of the peoples, and you see uh, the time of mourning for an only son in verse 10. When you see that mourning for an only son, that harkens to Zechariah 12, 10. They'll look upon me who they have pierced and one warns for an only son. Or Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. They'll look upon the one who they have pierced and mourn for the only son. Now, in verse 10, he shifts forward. So, he shifts gears from his own time to the first coming of Christ. Then he shifts gears again from verses 9 to 10 to the second coming of Christ. Everybody see it. He's always talking for three time frames, like all the prophets. The language becomes eschatological. So now he's speaking purely eschatologically, prophetically, for the last days. Or at least primarily. It'll be like a bitter day. And verse 11, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land. Not a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but rather for the hearing of the word of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, from north even to east. 
They'll go to and fro and seek the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. In that day, the beautiful virgins, the young men will faint from thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan. Now these again have ramifications for his own time. Dan was the most sinful region of northern Israel. And as the way of Beersheba lives, Beersheba was the southernmost point of Judah, Dan the northernmost point of Israel. Okay? They will fall and not rise again. A time will come when people will desperately seek the word of God. They will desperately want the good Bible study. They will desperately want to hear the true gospel preached evangelistically. They will desperately want somebody to expound the scripture. But it's not going to happen. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Look at what has happened. Seminaries are teaching less and less Greek and Hebrew, more and more programs, more and more management philosophies based on church growth that come from the secular realm of advertising and motivational psychology. Their preaching is motivational psychology, just using Christian jargon as we said at the conference yesterday. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. What used to be anointing is now hype. What used to be exposition is now hype artistry. It's all just rubbish. There's a famine for the hearing of the word of God. People are not being taught the scriptures in their churches the way they once were. Throughout the history of the church, there was no single sect, no movement in the history of the evangelical church that had a stronger biblical emphasis since the early church than the early brethren. The early brethren had a stronger scriptural influence than anybody else from their inception. Now? Now? That show is long over. I come from England where the brethren came from. I live in England. I'm American, but I live in England. Six little old ladies in a tin hut. The show is over. It's, 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 it's a nothing. It's a nonsense. Now, one time, the brethren took the word of God seriously. You stood up and preached. You better be careful and dot all your I's and cross all your T's because there'd be at least 10 other guys in the church who could preach as well as you can. That's the way they once were. You go back to the time of George Mueller and, and people like that. The brethren the, were serious. Now, now, I'm not picking on you. I'm just pointing out the brethren because we were in a church where most of the people are from a brethren background. But it's not just the brethren. Baptists, Pentecostals, all of them, it's across the board. Calvary chapels are declining rapidly without Chuck Smith already. They're just going down, 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 down. There is a famine for the hearing of the word of God. They're eating junk food. And they're being charged a very handsome price for the privilege. This is sad. This is very sad. It should not be. Now a time is going to come where they're going to wake up and realize it. A time is going to come when the foolish virgins are going to want batteries for their flashlights. Lights for their torches. But they're not going to get it. They're not going to get it. In an act of divine judgment, they will not get it. You don't want the food when it's available? God will take it back. You want to eat junk? Go eat junk. You want psychobabble? Go eat psychobabble. You want ecumenical trash? Go eat out of the garbage can. Go eat out of the devil's garbage can. That's what the ecumenical movement is. You want a purpose-driven lie? Go believe your lie. You want a famine? You're going to starve. And it will be a self inflicted starvation. A famine for the hearing of the word of God. Days are coming, declares the Lord, when there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Churches like this are not perfect. They have their problems. They have and will continue to have their growing pains. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. 
But so far, by the grace of Jesus, nobody goes hungry. Nobody should have to go hungry. The food is available to those who want it. What's going to happen when it's no longer available to those who want it? The time to get it is now. There's a famine for the hearing of the Word of God. God bless.